Welcome to the Piedmont Transplant Institute and the liver transplant program. We thank you for participating in the surgical education class. The purpose of the class is to help ensure a successful liver transplant experience and journey through our program. To start with, I'd like to give you a brief overview of this class. We're going to go over the brief history of liver transplantation, then follow with life before transplant and the waitlisting process, MELD score, the components of the MELD and the importance of where it places you on the transplant waiting list. We'll also touch upon surgical anatomy and the surgical steps of a liver transplant operation. And then we'll go over outcomes data, comparing Piedmont data to other centers in our region. Here you'll see a normal liver compared to that of a cirrhotic liver. There are several main causes of cirrhosis, but the end result is the same. To the right, you will see the cirrhotic liver, which obviously is shrunken, fibrotic appearing, and nodular. The most common causes of cirrhosis that we see here at Piedmont, as well as in the United States, are alcohol use excessively, as well as hepatitis C. To the left is a normal liver, and our hope is that this is, the, this is the type of liver that we can procure for you at the time of your transplant. It's a normal, healthy, purple eggplant color, a soft consistency with smooth edges, and a really nice looking organ. Depicted in this diagram is the vascular anatomy of the liver, most notably the portal vein. The portal vein is comprised of the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein. This is the sole drainage of all of the organs within the abdomen. Most of the symptoms experienced by patients with end-stage liver disease stem from portal hypertension, which is the backup of blood in the portal system. Depicted here is the classic example of a patient with end-stage liver disease. What you'll notice most notably is the jaundiced skin, the yellow discoloration of the skin, the muscle wasting associated with the protein calorie malnutrition that often comes with end-stage liver disease. These slides depict some of the most common signs and symptoms associated with portal hypertension. You can see the distended abdomen full of fluid known as ascites. That's a direct result of portal hypertension, as well as the peripheral edema in the legs and feet, as well as a chest x-ray showing what's called a hepatohydrothorax, which is a pleural effusion or buildup of fluid in the right chest. Here is an endoscopic view of someone with severe esophageal varices or dilated veins in the esophagus due to portal hypertension. Another example of that someone's abdominal wall who has extensive portal hypertension and dilated veins in the abdominal wall. This is also known as caput medusa or medusa's head. The result of portal hypertension um, oftentimes ends up with GI bleeding or GI hemorrhage and this often requires massive blood transfusion and is the sole reason for the morbidity and suffering associated with end-stage liver disease patients while they are awaiting transplantation. Another element of cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease which is separate or different from the symptoms of portal hypertension is the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. The cirrhotic liver is a fertile ground for the development of liver tumors that develop almost uniquely in those with end-stage liver disease. This CT scan shows you with the arrow a vascular lesion in the liver consistent with hepatocellular cancer. A commonly asked question of our patients is when do you need a liver transplant? When do the risks of waiting outweigh the risks associated with the surgery? And we're going to spend some time going over that. Although liver transplantation is extremely successful, it is not without risk. There are risks associated with the surgery itself. There are potential post-transplant infections. There is also risk associated with the immunosuppression, which is required post-transplant lifelong, as well as the small risk of post-transplant malignancy. However, these risks pale in comparison to the risks associated with end-stage liver disease. A very commonly asked question is, what is the MELD score and how does it apply to me? How does it affect my place on the waiting list? Briefly, the MELD score stands for the Model of End-Stage Liver Disease, 
and it's an equation made up of three variables, serum bilirubin, creatinine, and INR. The range of the MELD score is between 6 and 40, 6 being a normal score, and 40 being associated with a patient who is extremely sick, often in the intensive care unit due to the complications of their liver disease. The cutoff MELD score, where you benefit more from liver transplantation rather than staying with the liver that you have, is a MELD of 15. If your MELD is less than 15, we recommend following you unless you are extremely symptomatic from your liver disease. If your MELD is higher than 15, the data is very clear that your survival will be longer with a liver transplant than without, as well as a much improved quality of life. As you can see in this bar graph, the dotted line or dashed line depicted the average MELD score or the majority of liver transplants done in the early 2000s for MELDs in the high teens to low 20s versus today, which is the solid line, which has shown a clear increase in the MELD required to get you to the top of the wait list. So what does this mean to us? Unfortunately, this means that waiting times have increased and unfortunately the majority of patients at the time of transplant are sicker than they used to be just 10 years ago. A concern of many of our listed patients revolves around the timing of being called in for an organ offer. Many of our patients envision a cell phone or a beeper and a rush to the hospital. That is usually not the case. Most patients have about a 12 to 24 hour leeway time from the time of the organ being offered to the time when we actually have to take the recipient to the operating room. The majority of our deceased donors have a severe brain injury rendering them brain dead with no outlook for recovery. These patients are in an intensive care unit being kept alive with life support. Once a liver is identified for you and you are called in for potential liver transplantation. A separate team of surgeons from Piedmont will travel to the hospital where the donor is to assess the quality of the donor liver. The entire liver transplant surgery usually takes between four to six hours to complete. There are two main phases. Number one is the recipient hepatectomy, which involves the removal of the recipient's cirrhotic liver. The second portion of the operation involves implanting the new donor liver into the recipient, which also can take two to two and a half hours to complete. These are some real live photos of the surgical steps of the transplant. You can see that the recipient liver has already been removed, and in the foreground, the new liver is about to be implanted. It is attached by suture, and the upper cable anastomosis is about to be performed. This is a photo of sewing the vena cava of the donor liver to the vena cava of the recipient. This step shows the reconnection of the donor hepatic artery to the recipient hepatic artery. After all of the connections are complete, the liver is allowed to receive the recipient's blood, also known as reperfusion, and this photo depicts a liver that has been reperfused, is healthy, and already functioning. It is very common for the liver to begin working immediately after the clamps are removed and the recipient's blood is allowed to flow through the donor organ. Very commonly, we place surgical drains at the end of the operation to help guide us in treating you postoperatively. This cartoon depicts the common placement of those drains. These drains will be removed prior to your discharge from the hospital. Although we pride ourselves at Piedmont of having great outcomes for liver transplant, complications are sometimes inevitable. The most common surgical complications that we encounter are really in three categories. First and foremost, there is a 20 to 30 percent risk of postoperative bleeding which the majority of the times does not require a second operation to fix. The second most commonly encountered complication has to do with the bile duct and is related to biliary leaks or biliary stenosis. This also does not always require a second operation 
to fix. However, sometimes a second operation is required. The third category of complications experienced in our post-operative liver transplant recipients includes post-operative infection. Because rejection medicine or immunosuppression is required for all of our recipients, this puts them at increased risk for certain opportunistic infections. Prophylactic antibiotics and antivirals are used in the post-operative period to help prevent these infections. And this infection risk is extremely low. Surgical outcomes and the outcomes of our liver transplant patients are very important to us. And we are very proud of our outcomes data. This data is tracked not only regionally, but nationally, and is available to the public on a website referred to as the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. This can be found at srtr.org. Included at the end of this presentation is a video of one of our actual patients undergoing a liver transplant. This can help you gain some insight into the surgical steps associated with the operation. However, if this is uncomfortable for you, you do not need to watch it. The first surgical step of a liver transplant involves removing the recipient liver. This is called the recipient hepatectomy. What can be seen here is isolating the right and left hepatic arteries, which are then divided with surgical ties and cut. After isolating and dividing the hepatic arteries and portal vein, the next step of the liver transplant is mobilizing the liver from its ligamentous attachments off of the vena cava. These steps can be seen here. Once mobilization is complete, the recipient liver is removed. This is accomplished by clamping the portal vein and hepatic veins so that the liver is completely isolated from its blood supply and then it is cut out sharply with scissors. This diagram depicts placement of the clamps during the recipient hepatectomy. As seen in this diagram, the right, middle, and left hepatic vein branches are clamped together, and then their individual openings are spatulated to create one large opening, which will be used for the connection between the donor upper cava and the recipient vena cava. Just prior to reperfusion, the upper caval clamp as well as the portal vein clamp are removed and the donor liver is allowed to receive recipient blood. Most commonly, the liver begins to make bile shortly after reperfusion. After completion of the portal vein anastomosis and reperfusion, the remaining steps of a liver transplant involve the hepatic artery anastomosis as well as the biliary anastomosis. The hepatic artery is spatulated and joined primarily with fine permanent suture the artery is allowed to reperfuse 
And then the biliary anastomosis is performed usually in an end-to-end -end fashion, joining the recipient and donor ducts. Once completed, the patient is closed with two surgical drains and taken to the intensive care unit. The average operative time for a liver transplant is four to six hours, and the average length of stay for a liver transplant is 24 hours in the intensive care unit and a seven to eight day hospital stay.